Thank you all again for being here. I'm really having a good time with these lunch and learns, and I hope you're enjoying them as well. And if you ever have a topic you want to um, us to do, just get in touch with me, and we'll try and get it done. Um, so, also help yourself to seconds. We've got plenty. So, as I'm sure Greg won't mind if you get up and sneak around and go refill your bowl of cup. Uh, so, without further ado, our speaker today is Greg Carlton from Pill and Holland. Uh, he's originally from Madisonville. Um, he's been doing this for 30 years, and he does speak all over the country. And he was tried. He was. He's been recruited to go other places and work and live and be, but. He chose to be in Benton because he wanted to stay in Western Kentucky. Um, he likes their small community environment here in this area. And um, I'll let him tell you more. Okay. Yeah, I want, like I was in Arizona and Phoenix a couple weeks ago. Did a skydive while I was out there on my 50th birthday. I thought that was pretty cool. Well, I do something epic every 10 years on my birthday. So I chose to jump out on a perfectly good airplane. Which was great fun. It was crazy, but it was really cool. Event. So uh, spent a lot of time uh, dealing with wellness. So one of the things I learned a long time ago was when I was young, I was athletic. And then I got in business and I got really busy. And I wasn't athletic anymore. And so I put on 60 plus pounds. And I got arthritis. And I was nearly diabetic and I had all these issues. And nearly got to the place where I decided, look, my kids and my future grandchildren are more important than my eating styles and my lifestyle. So I changed, completely radically changed my lifestyle and got back to being an athlete, went and got picked my bike back up and decided to start cycling. And so I spent a lot of time, probably 100 to 200 miles riding, mountain bikes especially these days. Because if you're going to be in the health risk business, not health insurance business, but really I think it's about driving risk or keeping risk down, we're going to fix the health care system in the country. We're going to do it by changing the way we deal with ourselves. We start at home. So it's the old song that says, you know, if you want to look at the solution, look at it in the mirror. Well, the mirror is really us. And so I go all over the country and I talk about health reform, but in reality, the real message is what can we each do every day to change our own lives and our lifestyles and those that are around us to help improve ourselves. So in other words, the best way to save money is never spend money, right? So my claim to fame two years ago, the epic thing I wanted to do was I wanted to ride my mountain bike in a 100 plus mile race at better than 12,000 feet altitude. So I did what's called Lead Mill Trail 100, which is one of the hardest races in the world, and I finished it in 12 hours and, and five minutes. Now the bad news is that you had to finish it at under 12 to get the special prize, the bell buckle. But the good thing is I stopped two times during the race to help people who had fallen and crashed and were injured. So it probably cost me 45 minutes to an hour to stop and help and do the things that I knew were the right things to do, despite the fact that I wouldn't finish the race in time. So it was more important for me to be there, experience it. So that's the kind of, of individual I want to be when I grow up. And hopefully I'm growing up <laughs> one these days, as you can tell, I'm not very grown up. Uh, today we're going to take a few minutes and talk about health reform. I'll try to keep it at the 30,000 foot views, but we may get a little deeper at times if you want to. Uh, my background is in underwriting, so I tend to build a clock if you ask me what time it is. So you will have to just kind of rein me in if I'm getting too deep. Um, in the last 20 years, I've spent a lot of time doing things like taking lots and lots of classes around the master's and PhD level around health risk and analytics. So today we'll talk more about what the law says. I'm going to tell you, hopefully, pretty late today, you understand how that applies in daily life. I'm not an attorney or a CPA by practice. Most of the consulting work I do and my licenses allow me to give advice in connection with an insurance contract or a health risk contract or other kinds of contracts, as long as I don't give legal advice. But it is, so today's not about giving you legal or tax advice either. Um, I do have a lot of designations. They don't mean a whole lot unless you have a really good outcome when you're working with us as advisors. So, but it lets you know that I've spent a lot of time reading books and taking tests and doing classes and staying on top of things. The three things I want you to take away today are really about how to sort of identify the strategic impacts from healthcare reform uh, that are going to address each one of you either individually or as a business. To really look at uh, healthcare reform directly about how it affects you, 
because it affects everyone. Over 320 million Americans in the country. Everybody's people are going to be affected by it. And then consider how you would take up a plan of action to the extent it is going to affect you. So those are really three things that we're going to talk about. Uh, I'll mention briefly Inform on Reform. I know you all got your video project where you're uploading these. We have a similar process we call Inform on Reform, and it's part of what we call our Peel and Holland University. And it's an internal and external communications training. It's blogs, videos, uh, articles. So we're launching that in about a week. And we're doing these types of things here locally and regionally at least twice, sometimes three and four times a month. So if you want to give you a piece of paper before you leave, to the extent you want to be connected and subscribe to that, that site, you can subscribe to it, get the free information, and anywhere we're speaking or have one of our professionals, attorneys, CPAs, uh, HR folks speaking, you can go for free to these events. So today we're going to talk about before healthcare reform and after. Uh, quick look back on 2012, the recent updates. Again, I'm going to hit them at the high level. Mandates, penalties, developing your plan, what are those four key things you want to look at, and then how you would stay connected. So let's look sort of pre-reform and post-reform. And I'm going to hit this out again at 30,000 foot view. Mark broke this down into several areas. When you think about things like group health insurance, so if you've ever been on an employer health plan, those traditionally were, you never had to worry about someone telling you no. I mean, there were certain states and certain types of size plans that years and years ago you could be declined. But more recently, since 1994, especially in Kentucky, if you were working for someone and you were eligible, you could have any disease you wanted, they couldn't tell you no. Now, it might tell you that if you hadn't been covered, they wouldn't cover a certain thing for up to 12 months. That even went away for the most part after 1986. So that was pretty well free reform. Now, what's going to happen after reform is pretty much nothing with the accessibility. What's going to happen, though, on the pre-existing conditions is that there are no pre-existing conditions after January 1, 2014. So you can be in a position where you say, I've been turned down for insurance as an individual. I couldn't get it, my child couldn't get it, my spouse couldn't get it, you will not be able to be declined as of January 1, 2014, anywhere in the United States. Okay? That's big. Okay? So it's really about accessibility for the most part. The other thing that happens is because you're going to be able to get it, you're going to be expected to get it. The government's going to say, unless you're one of the few people who are on an exceptions list, if you don't have an insurance plan, Medicare, Medicaid, group health plan, TRICARE, CHAMPAS, something that covers you, you will end up paying a tax beginning in 2015. So the government's going to be looking for you to say, did I have a plan at work? Did I have a plan on my own? Was I covered by some government program? If no, for the most part, they're going to be starting to tax you. Again, in the individual market, it was hard to get coverage. You had to be, I got turned down a few years ago. Remember I told you I had my own health problems? Well, even after I lost all my weight and I stopped, had, got, my doctor let me stop taking my medicine, I said, hey, maybe I can get a less expensive plan on my own. So I went and applied and they said, no, you still take this one medicine and you can't get on there. And I thought, gosh, I just rode a bike for 12 hours <laughs> at 12,000 feet, but you don't think I'm doing it. So that, that was the brokenness of the healthcare industry. Low wage, wage earners, now I want to set the stage for this. The government in the new law thinks low wage earners is a household income that makes less than about $97,000 a year. So to some people that is low wage. To other people that's a dream, right? But on a sliding scale from about ninety-five to 97000 for a family of four, down to about $32,000 is considered the new poverty level standard. It goes from 100% to, to 400%. And then one of the reasons I tell you this is that depending on what income you have and your other family members have will depend on the subsidies and credits that the government will potentially give you starting January 1, 2014. <coughs> if you buy coverage through one of their state or federally facilitated exchanges. And we'll talk about what an exchange is here in a minute. Again, individuals, were, it was hard to get coverage in the new plans they want. Starting January 1, I don't care if you're on your deathbed, you can buy a plan. But you can't be charged any more than anybody else your age. Okay? And you can only be charged three times what the youngest person's charged. So if you have a 20-year-old and a 60-year-old and the 20-year-old pays $100, the 60-year-old would pay no more than $300. 
so it was a new three to one ratio. Insurance marketplace was sort of decentralized and you know, different carriers and states did it this way. In the new marketplace, you're gonna have these public exchanges, you'll have private exchanges, you have lots of things that are coming up, more and more ways to buy individual and employer-based plans. Plan designs were really, really flexible in the creative reform. They're becoming less flexible. In other words, the government is telling employers, telling plans, you must at least do these things. Just two days ago, they released new regulations about what must be in a qualified health plan. There are 10 different parameters that have to be in every plan. You can add more to it, but it has to at least have those 10. Okay? And then every state sort of has an ability to set some additional parameters it wants in its plans. Okay? And then in reporting, one thing you notice here is lots and lots of reporting now. There was a lot of reporting for commercial employers before. There's even more now. There's more oversight, more regulatory <coughs> to answer to. And one of the things I would impress on you, if you own a business and you have a health care plan, it's highly likely you're not compliant with the government's rules even today. You probably won't be in 2014 if you're not careful. If you don't have someone helping you walk through those and wade through those legal requirements. I have never done an audit I didn't find someone out of compliance. And you definitely want to know you're out of compliance before an auditor, regulator, comes in and tells you that and finds you. As an example, starting January 1, there's one provision of the law, if they find you out of compliance, the fine is $1,000 for every employee for every time they find you out of compliance. And if you're out of compliance for one employee, you're most likely out of compliance for every employee. So if you own a business that has 50 employees and they find you're non-compliance, that's a big penalty. So, reform timeline sort of looks like this. In 2010, March 23rd, there was one bill passed. On March 30th, another bill passed. They combined the two bills together to form what's now called the Affordable Care Act. Honestly, not a political statement. There's not a lot affordable about the Affordable Care Act right now. It's about accessibility, okay? You're gonna see costs go up. I looked yesterday, I had our actuary prepare some information for me. We're gonna probably see rates in the individual and small group market go up between 18 and 40% next year. Okay, so get prepared. What's gonna probably happen is, if you haven't already moved to a higher deductible plan or lost your co-pays and you pay all your drugs and just get discounts, that's probably where you're gonna naturally migrate towards to keep the rates down lower like they are today. Now everybody would say, but I thought healthcare reform was supposed to be about making healthcare more affordable. <coughs> No, I mean, it's not proved to be that way. And think about it. If you tell me as a business owner, well, before you did it one way and now, you have to take everybody regardless of their risk. You have to pay everybody's claims regardless of whether they ever had a plan or not, whether they ever paid into the system. It's like setting up a retirement plan and saying, you got to pay retirement benefits on the 21-year-old, and oh, by the way, you got to take the 64 year old as well, and when they retire a year, you get to pay them the same thing you pay the 21 year old. Well, somebody's got to pay all that money out. So that's what's happening is they're, they're making everyone step up and pay more, which is why they have an individual tax, there's a business tax, there's taxes on the insurance industry, there's taxes on hospitals. So all these taxes are getting gathered up in order to help pay for these services. Had a lot of things getting ready for health reform, compliances, notices, all these reforms, they're mainly market reforms. They were talking about what's in a plan, what should be in a plan, what are the rules. And then starting in 2014, you have things like mandates. These are things that you have to do, the government has to do, the states have to do, so it's who has to do what, when. The exchanges are implemented. This, an exchange is not an insurance carrier. An exchange is an electronic system. It's basically like a computer system, almost like a, an Amazon or an eBay type of system where a travelocity. Theoretically, there'll be states that'll have these. Some states will be working with the federal government to have them, and some will be the federal government who does it. Okay, depending on what state you live in will depend on whether you deal with a state or you deal with the federal government or a combination of those two. But it's basically like logging on and saying, hey, I'm Greg, and I'm 50 years old. And I want to know what's, what kind of plan can I get. And if I'm an employer, theoretically, between now and 2016, I'll be able to do this for my employees. And I'll be able to shop, supposedly, for care. 
and it'll say, well, Blue Cross and Aetna and United Healthcare and, Aetna and all these different firms. Well, I don't know who'll be there because none of the firms have stepped up and said they're going to participate yet. So I won't know that for months. In fact, right now we're running under what's called interim final regulations. There's going to be a hearing on April 23rd, basically when the government will say, we've heard everyone's cries, and now we're going to give the edict of this is how it's going to be. I suspect that's when we'll start seeing other things decided upon. Who will be in, who will be out. There's guarantee issue, no pre-ex, and then there's low income premium assistance. So again, remember we defined low income. It's based on your federal poverty level. Those are based on your income as a household. It's also based on the number of people who are in your household. So a family of six or a family of eight would have a much higher poverty level threshold than someone with an income of one. So we'll look at some of that here in just a second. So looking back, any of you have employer plans, maybe received a letter and said, hey, this insurance carrier had to give you some extra money called uh, medical rebate. Okay, so if you got a medical rebate check, that was a good thing. Okay, small group has one way of doing it, large group has another way of doing it. Okay, that was for 11 claims that they had to pay out money in 12. The same thing will happen this year. They'll tally it all up by June 1st. They have to have the reports out to the government. They have to send the checks out by August. It's only effective in the fully insured markets. Okay? So if you're in a self-insured plan or you work for some big company that does their own program, the rebates won't affect you. Only if you're in an insured plan. Okay? Women's preventive services. This is something a lot of women wanted expanded. So it expanded in 2010 in October. But then it further expanded in August last year. So there's an entire litany of things that ladies can have done now in terms of preventive care that they couldn't do in years past. Okay. Now, some of the issues that you've seen in the media around this are over the FDA-approved uh, legal contraceptives. Because in the new law, the law says that a non-grandfather, in other words, a plan that doesn't meet certain qualifications and wasn't on the books in 2010, has to pay out all of these services with no cost share to the member. So if a lady goes in today and is on one of these special plans, they get a litany of services provided. One of those services is a partial abortion pill. It's called an abortive services therapeutic drug. It's on the FDA approved list, it's number 18. So you hear a lot of uproar in some communities around the country, and especially around religious groups right now, about is that right or wrong, and should that be in there, and should the plans be paying for that? So that is there in that bill today, and that's what everybody's arguing over. So when you turn on the television and you see it come up and say, the Catholic diocese and the so-and-so, and Hobby Lobby's been suing the government over this because they, as a business, don't think that it's right. Okay, so they're taking a stand on their what they believe in and saying, we don't care if you tell us we have to, we're not going to do it. So they're suing the government over this, Hobby Lobby. Okay. So you're going to see more and more of that challenge type atmosphere in this law that folks over. Lots more uh, reporting. I don't know if you run a small business, it probably didn't affect you much. It kept getting pushed off. The rule around W-2s now is if you don't issue more than 250 W-2s, you didn't have to do this last year, but you will eventually have to report this next session. You have to start putting health care related expenses on Form W-2. Grandfather, I mentioned just a minute ago, I've created a checklist around grandfathering. This is a big deal because if you had a plan in 2010 and you haven't made any major changes or changed how you share the cost of it, you may still be a grandfather plan. There are special compliance and rules that go with having that type of program. You need to know how to maintain one, how to deal with the compliance around it. And then again, things like I noted here, switching carriers, eliminating benefits, increasing the percentage share that you have with members, those are all things that could keep you from being grandfathered. Recent updates, again, wellness programs. They're pushing wellness. So you're going to see more and more ads on the TV, more and more employers stepping up and doing employee incentives. The old incentives under the HIPAA rules were 20% credits could be given for someone in a bona fide wellness program. That's going to go to 30% in 2014. So again, remember how I said the rates are going to rise? The answer to that rising rate for some employers will be they'll put in wellness programs and they'll develop incentive programs to help bring the cost back down, up to 30%. More recently, you heard some rulings that said, well, if tobacco smokers, 
Well, people who use tobacco can be charged one and a half times the normal standard rate. So that's got a lot of people really upset right now. Why should I be charged more if I smoke? Okay, but that's the new rule: is if you're healthy, you're going to get a lower rate. If you don't smoke, you'll get a better rate. If you smoke, you'll get a higher rate in the future, potentially. You know. And again, lots of things around small group and large group. Okay, we won't get into those details, but know that you need to know whether you're small or large. And I'll just give you a hint. They don't count the way we count. Okay. So 50 is a magic number, and it's called 50 uh, full-time equivalents. So for those of you that have been dealing with HR in the past, you may know how to count a full-time equivalent. The government has its own system of counting full-time equivalents and what counts. So if you're not sure about that and you're saying, hey, I run a business or an organization that has 47 employees that are full, truly full-time, and I have some more that are part-time, and I have some more that are seasonal, you probably have more than 50, even though you don't think of it that way. And there are special rules that apply to you, including penalties of two to $3,000 an employee per year if you're not compliant with the new law. So looking forward, again, shared responsibility is a big thing on here. That's everybody paying their fair share. So I want to get into player pay. This is the big Now, just a quick show of hands. Anybody with, they bet you think you have 50 or more employees? Like, doesn't think or you have? Do you know if you have 50 or more? Okay. Okay, some may. Okay. General rule is 50 or more of these type of people. Does an employee work 30 or more hours a week? That's now full time. As of 2014, January, that's the full time definition of 30 hours a week. It's not 40, it's not 35 or 32, it's 30. So I stack up all my 30s. And then I take all of my hours of my part time working less than 30, and I put them in for one month, and I put them in a bucket, and I divide that bucket by 120. That then tells me a number. I add that number to the first number. And then I decide whether I have any seasonal employees that will work more than four months. And I have to deal with that number. When I add all three numbers up, it tells me if I have 50 or more. So usually you know whether you're 50 or more, but sometimes you're kind of on that flat. Okay. Well, why it's important is that if you're playing, it means you have to have the right plan. You have to run the right plan costs for your employees, or you're fined. Or a better way is you're taxed. But the whole argument last year at the Supreme Court was whether or not this was a tax or a fine. If it was a penalty, they were going to vote one way. If it was a tax, they were going to vote another way. Well, they came up and finally said, it's a tax. Okay. So it is a tax. If you're going to play, you have to play the right way, or you get taxed. If you're going to pay, you say, you know what, I've got these 50 or more equivalent employees. I've never had a plan, or I've got one, and I'm just going to get rid of it. Well, that's pretty simple. The fact that the, the tax is $2,000 a year, it's divvied out on a monthly basis, but it's basically $2,000 a year multiplied times all of your full-time employees. You get a 30 employee credit. So some small employers will say, well, I only have 30 full-timers, even though I have the 50 plus because of all my part-timers. I still have 30. Well, you get off scot-free. But I have one client. It's a not-for-profit. They have 180 full-time employees and they don't make enough money every year to give them health insurance. So they give everybody a little bit of money through their flex plan. That employer would be, would be done this way. 180 employees minus 30 is 150. 150 times 2,000 is 300,000. So that not-for-profit not company is looking at spending $300,000. The bad thing also is it's an excise tax, which means it's non-deductible. So if you're a business that pays income taxes, it's not just a $2,000 tax. You have to make $4,000 almost to pay the $2,000 tax. Now, if you're, in the, if you're in a business owner, Pat, you're thinking this way. How much does it cost me to make $4,000 in retained earnings? In other words, pre-tax earnings. Well, if I'm selling cars and I make $500 a car, I don't know what they make, but <laughs> how many cars is that? All right, I got to sell eight cars. You have to do forty percent more a year. You got to do forty percent more, whatever it is, just, just to stay tax. baseline. Now, what did I not do? I don't have a health plan. So now when I go to hire someone, I say, "Come to work for me." 
leave this big company, leave this whatever, leave the government, come to work for me. They go, why would I want to come to work for you? You don't have health insurance. Okay, I'll raise your pay. What happens when you raise somebody's pay to make up for your benefits? They pay tax and we write it off. So that's the issue that we have with the pay. The pay is not just the penalty. The pay side of this is the penalty, the tax, the workers' compensation, the general liability, the FIDA, all the things that go into running a business. I think people that have never run a business maybe not completely understand this side of the equation. So you've had to make payroll, it's tough, right? For those of you that have ever made payroll, you understand what it's like up here. Now the play to pay is sort of the black eye after you lost the fight. <laughs> the play to pay says, I really do need a health plan to hire and attract the right workers. And then you inadvertently don't do it right or one of your workers still qualifies for one of these subsidies. If that's the case, then you pay a $3,000 penalty for the ones that get the subsidy. So even though I gave you a plan, if I don't give you the right plan or if I don't give it at the right price, I still get penalized. And again, it's another tax. So it's $3,000, it's, it's an excise tax. Just a stupid question. Are, with you saying all this, are employers, because you see them on nationally, are they thinking, I'm just going to get rid of employees? Yes. Well, we're seeing it's a lot of things. Like I have some employers that have restaurants. One employer the other day said, what if I take my 30 employees and I share them with my friend who also runs a, a McDonald's, and that person has 30, so I'll take his 30 half time, and he'll take my 30 half time, and I'll only work 60 employees now for 20 hours, and he'll work 60 employees for 20 hours. Today it's permissible. Because as long as you don't have anyone working more than 30 hours, the penalty doesn't apply. Mm -hmm. So that's going to happen. You see a big swing in part-time workers, just now. Um, seasonal. How do you figure that into that? I mean, you were saying there's the equation. You put in the 30 considered full-time, and then let's say you've got 160 kids, or we have a water park, that work in that you know, May to September. How do you throw those in the bucket to figure that? Yeah, the issue is two parts. One is you still include them when it comes to their So if they're part-time, like they're working less than 30, you'd still put them in the part-time bucket. Okay. But you'd set them over here temporarily as how many of those don't work 120 days? Okay. And then if, if you look back at the second part of that is, once I've got all these equations done, have I averaged more than 50 FTEs okay, for more than four months? If the answer is yes, you can't get out of count. If the answer is no, I only really bump up really high for a month or two or three and then it jumps back down, then you can strip back out your seasonal people out of the equation. Well, I know some work more than 30 hours a week. Yeah. That's not a problem. You'll have to separate those. you have to put the non-30s in one bucket and the 30 plus in another bucket and count them. Then you have to strip them back out of the equation. Is there an age limit? So if you have a 14-year-old kid. You have a 100-year-old working or a 14-year-old? Now, if you get into some of this and you want to know some math, I'll give you my card. You can call me and I'll help you work through the math. But anyway, it's just good to know, right, that there's some things to have on the radar strategically. Player pay full time, okay, gets the subsidy, get those in just state exchange. This is what triggers the tax. So if you're in an employer situation like we are, we give our employees their health care. As long as I do that, I, and I have a qualified plan, and it's not costing the employee. Now, I didn't say the spouse or child part, but just the employee part, I'm giving them that free. I'll not have to worry about the penalty. So that's the requirement. <laughs> no, not free. It's just I do that. I give it free. Oh. Now, I'm going to tell you how you can charge them some money and still not get taxed. Okay. <laughs> and then we talked about determining full time, right? Full time employees plus. Hours of service for the non-full-time, divided by 120 equals your full-time equivalents. And then again, remember there's a special rule for less than 120 days on the seasonal. So I want you to see this graphically. Some of us are visual learners, so I want you to see it sort of right now. So full-time, and what is full-time? 30 hours. 30 or more. Starting in January. Starting in January. Now, you can do anything you want. You can hire people and say, hey, this is a 40-hour position. They're not telling you you have to hire them working 30. They're just saying, for this calculation, you have to count someone working 30 more ads. So as an example, I've employers that say, well, to get our insurance, you have to work 40. 
Well, that's fine. You can still do that. But the government's going to count the other 10 hours and decide whether you have 50 or more employees for the penalty. Okay. So the individual mandate, again, the thing to remember here is everyone, unless you're on an exceptions list, and there, and there is a list, but it's people like people who are incarcerated, illegal aliens, unless it's against your religion, I don't know how to figure that out. But anyway, <laughs> those people are accepted. Otherwise, you have Medicare, Medicaid, TRICARE, Champus, a government plan, or your employer plan, or an individual plan that qualifies by January 1, 2014. These are the exceptions, again, not lawful in the U.S. You know, if you have a hardship, healthcare sharing ministries, member of Indian tribes. I don't have any of those we have here, so if you have any Indian tribe members here, you don't have to. Now, the joke of this, I say this laughing like it, this is really a tax that's, again, spread, this individual mandate tax is spread towards the high income earners. Because it's the greater of 1% of your income in next year, or the floor is $95 a year. So let me put it to you this way. I'm going to give you an ultimatum. Either go get a health insurance plan that could be $100 or $200 or $300 a month or more, or pay $95 in tax in 2015 to the government, or 1% of your income. So go figure. If you make more than $9,500, right? $9,500 would be $95 in 1% increments. All right, so if you made $100,000, how much would your tax be? $1,000. Thousand divided by twelve is eighty-three dollars. Mm -hmm. It's still cheaper than going buying health insurance. And think about it. What did I say earlier? No okay. pre-existing conditions, right? All right, I'm healthy. If I don't have an accident or die on the way to the hospital, assuming I'm close to an open enrollment period, I can just sign up and January one the next year. I can go in and get a plan that pays all my bills. Now in 2015, it's 2% of income and 25 in 16. So again, even if I make $100,000 a year, I'm paying $2,500 a fine for me. Now that's per adult. So that's why I said it's really geared towards higher income earners, because if I'm in a family of four and I'm making 100 grand in 2016, it's 2500 for me, 2500 for my spouse. And if I've got two kids, it's another 2500 half for the kids, so two kids would equal one. Okay. So, now we still get floors and all these, or maximums and all these, unless you make too much money. So this whole bill is based on who makes less and who makes more. Now, another fallacy in that law. Your employee that makes, or you're your self-employed, you make a quarter of a million dollars. And you say, well, I don't want to pay $10,000 tax. Okay, the IRS can attempt to collect it, by reducing future tax refunds. Okay, so just don't pay in enough. So you always owe them more. Individuals who fail to, <laughs> individuals who fail to pay the penalty will not be subject to criminal prosecution or penalty. They can't place any levies or fines on your home or other business property or whatever. So it's a tax that has no teeth. Okay. Aren't you glad you came to that? <laughs> so boring. So again, Premium subsidies, again, we talked about this, but it's all based on poverty, poverty standards. Starting out with 100 will be Medicaid. When you hit 133%, it starts to play into this new system. When you hit 400%, it goes out of the system. So as an example, these are 2014 estimated poverty guidelines. A family of four, 100% is at 24,000, 133% is at 32,000. There's a little quirky thing in the law that's a 5% look away. So it basically moves that 133% to 138, technically, the way Medicaid works. If you're at 400%, you're about 97,000 for a family of four. Now look, if you're a family of eight, you're at 63,000. Know, so if you're the Osmonds or somebody like that, you can actually make a lot more money and you get some subsidy. So I'm going to give you an example of some subsidies in a minute. Remember I said public exchanges, different states are doing these different ways. Kentucky's got one. We'll have one starting January 1. It's going to open its doors in October. You see the blue are going to have them. The yellow uh, are actually going to be working with the federal government. And then there's a few states that said, well, we're just not sure how we're going to do it. In Kentucky, we have 19 board members on our panel. There's 70 
million dollar grant the federal government gave Kentucky to establish this exchange. <laughs> How many people could I provide health services for for with seven million dollars? <laughs> so we gave federal government gave Kentucky a seventy million dollar grant to establish a computer system to allow people to come in and acquire their insurance more efficiently. You know, we you know, I love Forrest Gump. I'll probably watch that movie once a week. I don't know what that says about me. <laughs> this is one of my favorite movies. One part of the movie it says sometimes there just aren't enough rocks. <laughs> I know where all the rocks came from. <coughs> but truly, so in these exchanges, it's gonna kind of feel like a one size fits all or a four size fits all. With one exception for young kids under 20, under 30, I say kids, well, young adults under 30. If you go to an exchange, you're going to be stuck with different benefit plans, but they're going to be based on these metal levels, kind of like the Olympics. They're going to say bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. So you pick your plan. And so whether you're with Aetna or Anthem or United or Human or whoever it is, you're going to pick a plan based on these metal levels. When you get your subsidy from the government, they're going to base it on the silver plan. If you want to buy a more a valuable plan, you have to pay the difference. Okay. So that's how all this is working in. So here's an example. Here's a family of four. They made, this is all based on modified adjusted income. So that's row 38 of your form 1040. Okay. <coughs> so when you look at your form 1040, you know this will end up being for next year, but you can probably look at this year's unless you got lots of variation and say, okay, well my row 38 was $60,543. <coughs> That puts them at 250% of the federal poverty level. Their family share of premium, the government says, is 8.05% that they should be paying as a family. That means that their annual cost of a plan at the silver level is estimated to be about $12,000. They say a silver plan should cost a family $1,000 a month. Annual max that they should pay based on their income level is uh, $4,874, so therefore, the subsidy the government gives is $7,126 for that family. As the income goes up, the subsidy comes down. As the income goes down, the subsidy goes up. Now, if you're an employee and you're making $30,000 a year and your employer comes to you and says, congratulations, we'd like to give you a motion and a raise. You're getting a subsidy, and now suddenly your subsidy goes down. What would we do like this? Cash. I think I'd prefer not. I think I'd prefer not to go to that class, get more education, raise my income, my standard of living, because I'm living on subsidies from the government. Yes, ma'am. Like with mine, I and just kind of thinking how this works. Um, of course, they had to report some of our size this year, and I know what my health plan costs, but I actually do not pay any out of pocket, even though that's reporting on my W 2. We have a wellness plan and they cover, and they actually pay me more than what my income plan is. Yeah, because money left over. The level of it. So, how, how does that play into it? Well, um, the basic way that works is this is that an employer who gives you the right style of plan, mm -hmm. and it, it going back to this chart, it has to be at least equal to a 60% actuarial value because that's a minimum. So as long as in 2014 that employer says we have a 60% equivalent plan, that's one item. The second item is you pay no more than 9.5% of your household income. So back to the modified adjusting. No more than 9.5% of the 60000 That employer can't be penalized. Okay. And because I know I'm in a grandfather plan because I noticed this year when we went through um, open enrollment that you can choose for the grandfather. So now, what would an employer not know in that situation, though? If I said, hey, that, that's great, okay, I'm going to give you a 60% plan. Well, I'm going to give you the 60% plan, and, you know, because the government says it can't be more than 9.5% of your adjusted gross income, I'll just charge you 9.4% of your adjusted gross income. I don't know many employers that know your adjusted gross income. <clears throat> they know your box one W two. <laughs> so there's three safe harbors that the government put in when you're dealing with these, these taxes. One safe harbor was since you won't know household income, you can use box one W two. If you don't charge them more than nine and a half percent of box one W two, you're good. Second safe harbor was federal poverty line. 
you know what, once it's published, you know what one person's federal poverty level is. So as long as you don't charge more than that, at 99% of that number, you're good. The last was, you know you got all this list of employees, whatever the lowest wage is. So if you pay everybody more than $10 an hour, you can use $10 an hour divided by 9.5% and give you that equivalent amount you can charge for their health insurance and you would be good to go. So there's three ways. You don't have to do them all three, you can do any of them. So remember, if you're a small employer, so those employers that for, for Kentucky, it's less than 50. Okay. 2014 and 15, the individual and small group market's less than 50. Okay. In 2016, they're going to broaden that and let individuals, small employers, up to 100. And then starting in 17, it'll be all size organizations can come into these exchanges and use the exchanges. The exchanges are going to open in Kentucky October 1 for people to start playing around with the computers. They'll start enrolling people, though, in January for January effectively. This first year, they're going to leave it open until March 31. So remember how I said maybe you're doing without, you forget, whatever. Then you decide you want in. You'll be able to get in between October and March. If you get in after January 1, your coverage wouldn't start to take effect January 1. It would start the next month. But next year, the important part is you're going to have from October 15th to December 7th. So they're going to push the window down. And they're going to say, hey, if you don't get in during this time or have a good reason why you didn't, you can't get in. That's how they're going to control the flow of people in and out in this thing. So they're going to put, basically they're going to push everybody to have, that their health plans are going to have to take effect January 1st. Not necessarily, they're just, if you want to be in an exchange, you'll have to be at January 1st. You, know, you can still have an independent plan. And a lot of employers are telling them they are. The actuaries tell me in about three or four years the exchange rates will be so high no one will want to be in it anyway, unless you're just super unhealthy and you can't get it anywhere else. So to combat some of this, as an example, as an employer, because you the last thing you want to do is have your employees in a bad place. So you say, okay, I'm gonna just I'm just gonna give you some money and I'll let you buy it on your own. But what happens if you give them two hundred dollars, which is the going price maybe, and in three years it's a it's a five hundred dollar are you going to fess up the other money, or are you going to say, well, I need to figure out a better way to do this? So I think what's going to happen is you're going to see this huge trend, because we're already hearing that employees that are saying, oh, man, I want that subsidy, those typically are the employees that are saying they're, they're the smokers, they're not taking care of themselves, they've not had a plan forever. So it's all of the bad risk is tending to kind of move towards exchange. The good risks are saying, can I have a plan on my own? Can I be in an employer plan? What if we had a wellness plan, like to your point? Could we give incentives? How do we get our employees healthier? Because employers realize that when someone's healthy, they don't miss work as much. They do better work while they're on the job. They're happier at home. They're happier at work, right? So they understand the productivity curve. So that's what you're saying. Industry's coming to us and saying, help us design a wellness program. Help us design a program that's compliant, that keeps my cost down. Move me to a self-insured stock plan, away from these fully insured plans that have all the taxes and have all the extra requirements on them. So that's what there's happening. The other part is associations. So now chambers had association plans. This is important for the chambers. Chamber plans will not be in place starting January 1, 2014. Because one of the provisions of the health care reform is called a commonality provision. It says if you have a chamber plan or another plan, you have to have commonality among all your members. And commonality in business does not mean you meet and have lunch. It means you're in the same industry. So governments will be in a plan, cities will be in a plan, states, counties, manufacturers, construction firms. You'll be in your own little pockets called associations and it'll be commonality among them. The second thing is it'll be run as one big plan. So like a lot of these associations, I manage one of them that has about 4,000 uh, employees, 10,000 or so lives. And today it is run like one decision making process, but we have 140 or so employers within that. In, Jan in 2014, that will be run as if it were like one business with departments. 
So all the record keeping will be the responsibility of whoever runs the plan. All the COBRA notices will be the responsibility. Right now I have 140 different firms having to do all this stuff. It'll suddenly become our responsibility if we're the sponsor or the plan sponsor if it's an association. But now what happens is I get out of all the community rating, I get out of all the stuff that I have to deal with as a small employer. And I get treated special by being a big employer. Okay. So some things we're suggesting, and again, you all whether your individuals or what, you need to sort of know what's going on in the space, start to create your what is my plan today? Do I have a plan? Am I an individual plan? Do I have a small group, large group? Do I have a wellness program? How do I manage health risk? How do I make sure my employees are healthy coming to work? Um, again, determining your size is a big issue there. So we can go through those calculations. I've got a little few packets if you all want some packets on how to do some of this. We're doing impact analysis for almost every client, especially if they've got any size. Um, we've got clients that are a few dozen employees all the way up to thousands of employees. But these impact analysis are weeks and weeks of work. They're very expensive. If there are our clients, right now we're not charging to do that. If we keep getting squeezed and squeezed and squeezed on fees we're paid in by, directly by contracts, we probably will have to start charging it. That's another part of the law that we see changing. And then you want to figure out who needs to know my plan once I've developed it, who do I need to bring in my, own, in my company or my team, how do I communicate to, to my employees. Because look, if you do a poor job of communicating, the next thing you know, some employers got their act together, and they're communicating well, and they're going to snipe their employees. And I tell you, one thing I'm already seeing is yesterday I was at, I did one of these sessions for about 85 people. Lots of HR people there, lots of uh, managers, owners, businesses, and they're looking for good HR people. One of them came up to me and said, who are the, best, who are the top 10 HR people in this room? And I'm saying, well, you know, we can talk later. I'm not sure I can just point them out to you. But they're wanting to snipe good HR people right now. Because so it's important for them to understand. They need to know this, own it, wire it tight, because it can be big money if they don't do it right. Not just because of the penalties and the fines, but because you've got lives on the line with employees. If an employee gets this messed up, why is this not like travelocity? You know, somebody told me, that, well, if it's just as easy as travel loss, you're going to be out of business. I said, no, because I don't sell insurance. I'm a risk advisor. I mean, I do a lot of things that people need to pay for services, just like attorneys and CPAs and doctors. But I said, more importantly than that, let's think about it. If I go on and buy an airline ticket and I screw up and I get to the counter and they tell me I forgot to pay for my bag fee, it's 25 or 50 bucks and I go on. If I miss my plane, so what? If I go online and I screw up my health insurance and then I get sick, it could cost me my house. So this is really important that we get it right. So again, anything we can do to help you, we're doing these systems, uh, inform on reform, uh, at no cost to clients and, and folks that want to attend. I've got a March webinar if you want to sit in on it. It's called Improving Your Odds of Success. Uh, April is on navigating the exchanges. Then I've got client education coming up on March 20th. It's FMLA and other issues. April will be the, the formal health care reform update because by then we'll sort of know what the law is going to sort of finalize that. Yes, sir. Yeah, what, what effect will the health care reform act uh, have on Medicare supplements and other than eliminating that, the advantage plan? The longer term will be that the extra money that you had to pay on the prescription drugs is going to shrink between now and 2019. They're basically giving additional credits on those year by year by year until it shrinks out, assuming that stays in play. My concern about a lot of these provisions is that will the government have the money to pay it? So we talk about all these subsidies, but we're sitting here and we've got a March 1 deadline on sequestration and whether or not we're going to have things go out the door or not. And yet we're talking about paying billions and trillions of dollars for subsidies. Yeah, I just said the and we said the fine is unenforceable at this point. Right. So my concern is we, if we go down this path and people make decisions thinking they're going to get free, there's no such thing as free, free money from the government, and then it's not there in a year or two, where are you going to be? Right. 
And like on Medicare, they say, well, we're going to make the donut hole go away. That was the provision where you had to pay more for your medicine, right? You had medicine up to here, then, they, then you paid yours, and then they start paying you. They're trying to shrink that donut hole. That's one thing. They're going to try to do more preventive care is another thing. They made the $250 deal go away in 2010. But no more advantage plans. Right. But yeah, advantage plans are kind of being shifted away. Are they um, going to be gone next year? Probably, or they'll be completely changed. And a lot depends on all these hearings they're having right now, between now and April, how it all comes out. So again, just, uh, and then for those of you that are in HR, we're having an interviewing skills session in April. Uh, Randy Fox from Capstone HR, who uh, is our lead liaison in HR, will be doing that for us. Randy ran the uh, HR for uh, Renton um, uh, Mining Company, and then down in Benton, it was uh, 3A Composites. He was HR there for years and years, 20 plus years. So very good uh, gentleman in HR. He's going to handle that. So, and then the rest of the year, in fact, I'm going to hand you out a uh, sheet, and you can pass these around. You're going to notice the rest of the year we have lots and lots of these sessions that you can plug into either online or in person. So feel free to do that. And uh, any other questions today? I know we probably run a little close on time. So we'll take questions afterwards. Did you see the piece of Time Magazine where they said from 50% last year to, or from the last several years to this year or this past year, 60% of the bankruptcies in America, America are due to medical bills? Health, health care, yeah. That's in Time Magazine now. It is. Now, we did talk about the impact of hospitals today, but I can tell you there's a huge hospital impact. So this gentleman asked a question about Medicare, and Medicare and Medicaid both, there's, there are provisions in the bill that are going to require hospitals to improve their quality and basically provide other types of services and among other things. But as an example, they're looking at it especially Medicaid and Medicare. If they if the hospital brings a patient in and treats them and then they turn around and send them home and then they turn around and come back, that's called a readmit. Mm -hmm. So if your readmit rate goes up among basically above a certain standard that they're going to set, then the amount of money you get will drop as a hospital. Okay? They're also doing things under primary care. For for the next two years, primary care is getting some subsidies basically but in the long term, primary care and other types of health care are going to get cut substantially. The idea longer term is they want doctors and hospitals to be not treating illnesses, but preventing illnesses. Which is not all in all a bad thing, but you have to get there, right? So, you've got a lot of people in this country that are not healthy today, and if you don't take care of them, they're going to get worse. At the same, so there's really sort of three buckets of individuals in general. There's those that are fairly young and healthy and that need to stay healthy. You get people that are in the middle that are rather healthy, they need to stay healthy, okay, in that same plane. Then you have people who are chronically ill, whether they genetically disposed to it or they just had the lifestyle that created the problem, okay? I mean, let's face it, if you've drank for 40 years and you have cirrhosis of the liver, that's probably something you, to a degree, had brought on yourself. I'm not make a political statement, I'm just saying, okay. Um, at the same time, if you said, well, but I was 50 years old and never had a problem in my life and healthy and ain't healthy every day and I got breast cancer, there's probably nothing anybody could have done or you could have done to prevent it. It, it happens, okay. Same thing with colon cancer. Now, mm -hmm. they are finding out now that certain types of cancer, obviously cardiovascular disease, strokes and things, while parts of them are hereditary, there are things we can do to prevent those. So, they're pushing the entire healthcare community to start engaging patients with more primary care and preventive care. So if you're in a plan today that is not grandfathered, like she said grandfather plan, there is a prescribed A and B list for preventive services based on your age and sex and some other uh, questions. And it is a very exhaustive list of what providers can and will be doing to suggest you do on preventive care in the future. So that's how everything's sort of moving down that path. The other thing I'm seeing is more transparency. So as an example, I've created tools because of the data that's now available that if you called me and said, hey, 
what's the difference between CT scans, MRIs, colonoscopies, and 62 other items within 50 miles of Eddyville? Well, why would you care, right? Well, you would care because everything's moving towards higher deductibles and making you pay more out of your pocket when you get care. So if I have to go get a CT scan, I want to know if I'm paying $300 or $1,200 because it's coming out of my pocket as an individual, right? Or out of my flex account or my HSA. So the, the transparency is a big issue these days. So that's kind of how we're moving. So the three things I wanted to do for you is kind of paint the broader picture. Healthcare reform is affecting everybody, right? There are going to be a lot of taxes and penalties and fines if people don't play the game the way the government has set the game out. And the key to success is understanding what the rules are, knowing the monopoly rules, knowing how to play the monopoly game so you win alone. So for, for some small companies, it's overwhelming. It is, and the good thing is that the penalties really don't apply until you get that magic 50 number. So the key is knowing how to keep yourself below that 50 number if you can afford to. Yes. Question, I own a construction company if I have subcontractors. Subcontractors, they don't carry liability insurance and or workers' comp. I'm the one that's responsible for that. Is that the same thing in regards to this? I mean, if they don't have a health care plan in place, am I going to be responsible for covering that too? Not likely, but okay. it depends. They're going to use what's called facts and circumstances rule. Basically understand whether or not you are dictating what their employees do. And it's probably not likely you get caught that way, but here's where it does happen. I've got contractors that are friends that say, I don't have any employees. All of my employees are subcontractors. And I say, do you tell them when to be at work? Well, sure. Do you tell them when to leave? Well, sure. Do you tell them what to do while they're there? Sure. Do you tell them whether or not they can do this, that, or buy this or that? Sure. And they're in your employees. Or your statutory employee, whether you want it to be or not. And that there are new rules every state has set based on what is an employee and what's not an employee, what's a contract. So good question. I doubt it. Same thing applies to like collective bargaining. If you've got the right kind of collective bargaining employees working, chances are you won't get hung out to dry. The wrong kind of contract, you can get stuck with them. If you be careful if you're using any what's called PEOs, professional employer organizations. Those are going to be yours as an employer to pick up. If you're leasing employees from like a temp firm, there's right now being said that leasing companies will have to pick that up, which is an entirely different thing. All the leasing companies are calling me now saying, I've got 300 employees and I've never had to do health care. Now suddenly the government's telling me I've got to do something or have to I know it's heavy on a Friday, especially, so at least you're out. I don't think you eat their lunch, Dan. <laughs> so, you know, I don't see anybody get too sick, but yeah. It's all really good information, too. Yeah, thank you. Sign up, plug in. I'm all around, so come see me or call me. I love talking to you guys. Thank you for the time. Thank you very much.